Good evening, everyone. Time for episode 30 of The Last Admiral. We'll pick up where we left off. We'll talk to page 244, the chapter entitled Shang Sun. The monastery's tall, cast iron gates stood open. Strong, red bricked construction formed its walls. A wide stone staircase rose to its front domed entrance. The roof of the meeting hall had four peaks and overhanging roof lines. Flanking the stairs were two vigilant carved lions, painted gold, each facing outward with one paw upraised. A pair of monks stood near the welcoming walkway. Their robes were colored yellow and orange, and they wore woven sandals on their feet. Their heads were cleanly shaven, and a circle of prayer beads surrounded their left wrists. Ordained priests of Shang Sun, they swore oaths of celibacy, honesty, and a noble warrior's code. Highly trained in the martial arts, they were masters in fighting with the body and with hardwood staves, and they, and they made up the entire faculty of the school. Welcome students, they greeted them. Hurry in, and don't worry about checking in, said one, for you are nearly late. Standing beneath the domed passage that led into the central courtyard of the temple grounds, the pair of brothers scarcely had time to take in their surroundings before hearing the call for formation. One hundred and eight fresh new students raced to find their place in four columns of twenty-seven, centered on an expansive field surrounded by columned walkways and picturesque statues. Racing down the courtyard stairs, Vlad and Derek fell into the loose assembly. The sun peered brightly over the east wall as last night's clouds swept eastward and away. Catwalks surrounded the entire courtyard, each lined neatly with short benches four rows deep and nine-inch pillars of stone supporting the roofs at regular intervals. Beautifully carved images of famous monks, generals, and animal spirits adorned the columns. The abbot was strangely absent from his high-backed seat centered on the north catwalk. Nine monks stood calmly before the cadets. One stepped forward and addressed them. He was tall and lean of build, with a hard yet kind-looking face, and large hands conditioned through training in the iron palm technique. His head was balding, and like Wraith, his goatee descended in three points from his face. "'Good morning, cadets,' he said. "'I am Master Drill. My true name is Li Quan Shan, but you will not address me by my true name until you have proven yourselves worthy. From now on, you will only address me as Master Drill. Is that clear? Yes, Vlad replied alone. Master Drill. Is that clear? He implored. Yes, Master Drill, the class replied. Very well, cadets, he informed them. I will be your instructor in the art of military drill, ceremony, and monastery rules and barracks requirements. The eight priests beside me will be your primary instructors while you are here. Each of them is the absolute master of their technique. You will refer to them only by their style names. Master Tiger, Master Lion, Crane, Phoenix, Unicorn, Monkey, Snake, and Master Dragon. Our abbot is the revered master. And the footnotes are Iron Palm, is a method of conditioning the hands for combat through impact training, using a variety of meetings, mediums, culminating with regular training using half-inch balls of iron placed in a large wok or similar container. Special medicines are used to prevent arthritis and other damaging effects of the training, and to strengthen bones and the other structures of the hand. Master Gu Yi Sang of Planet Earth was a famous practitioner who could crack a stack of 13 bricks with a single iron palm slap. Li Quan Shan of Planet Earth was the founder of Wa Lam Tam Toi Bok Tong Long Kung Fu, and his birth name was Yuk Tong, meaning Jade Mountain. Okay, so the abbot is the revered master Wong Long, founder of the Praying Mantis style and master of the One Finger Energy Meditation. 
you will refer to him as revered master. Is that clear? Yes, Master Drill, they answered. I know that many of you will fear the challenges that you will face here. You will know sadness, fear, and helplessness. I cannot help you to face these things. You must look inwardly. Find the pillar that cannot be broken. I will refer to your group as company when I address you, and you will respond in unison as quickly and in as organized of a manner as possible to my commands. Did I make myself clear? Yes, Master Drill, they responded. Very well, he replied. Company, attention! After examining them intently, he concluded that their maneuvers were somewhat less than perfect. Please watch closely, cadets, as I demonstrate the proper execution of the position of attention. Hold the body straight and tall, and bring the heels of the feet together. The feet flare outward at approximately a 45-degree angle to one another, while the arms hang naturally at one side with fingers curled inward at the second knuckle, with thumbs grasping the outside of the index finger. Both arms shall follow the external center line of the body, with hands touching near to the center of the thigh. The head and eyes face forward. The demeanor must be alert and present in the moment. Now have I made myself clear? Yes, Master Drill, they shouted. Company, he commanded. Attention! Stand ready for my inspection. Walking along in front of each row of cadets, he reacted little to the students around him. At least until he passed in front of two pupil, chipu, I'm sorry, until he passed in front of two pupils with decrepit uniforms, cadets. I have been master of drill here for fifteen years now. In all of that time, I have never seen a pair of recruits with such a disheveled and pathetic demeanor. State your name, cadet. Derek Alawan. He reported, master drill. And the footnote is one finger energy meditation is a method of training the internal force called chi and projecting it from the index finger. Masters can reputedly extinguish a candle several paces away and actually strike vital points on their opponent's bodies without touching them. <clears throat> and you, he asked. Vlad Lucheron, he replied. Master Drill. Well, he said, appearing to ponder the situation deeply. I am sure that you have a very good reason why you have arrived in formation in such a state. Be certain that it never happens again. The two of you have just volunteered for kitchen cleanup duty for your entire enrollment. Judging by your appearances, though, that will not be terribly long at all. Yes, they said. Master Drill. You both will report to the quartermaster every night after evening mess, and he will inform you of your duties. Yes, they replied. Master Drill. Just then, somewhere in the back of the column, another student chuckled. Oh no, Lee scolded. By the ten tigers, no. I did not just hear that. Am I mistaken? Or did you just find it amusing that another member of your team met with misfortune? No, Anselm replied. Master Drill. State your name, cadet. Anselm de Marchance, he reported. Well, Marchance. You have just been promoted to squad leader. You may think that this is a wanted privilege, but I assure you that from now until you are replaced, that you will be solely tested, as you are now responsible for 26 cadets, their performance and well-being. Is that clear? Yes, Anselm said. Master Drill. Master Lee stood three feet in front of him and studied him intently. Respect and fellowship are the first rules of Shang Sun. Respect for the masters their teachings, and each other. Evidence of hazing will result in dismissal. The abbot carefully selected every student in attendance. Each cadet shows promise and arrived with equal merit. Now, cadets, are we clear? Yes, Master Drill, they affirmed. First rank, he instructed. Cadet Marchance is your new squad leader. You will obey his lawful commands, and in return... He will be held accountable for your actions, well-being, and failures. Is that clear? Yes, they replied. Master Drill. Very well, then. I will continue with the first lesson. Execute the position of parade rest as follows. Beginning from the position of attention, 
spread the feet outwardly to a width equaling the span of the shoulders. Simultaneously lift both arms upwardly into the small of the lower back, with the left hand grasping the fingers of the right hand. Head, eyes, and posture remain alert and upright. Is that clear? Yes, they declared. Master Drill. Company, he commanded. Parade, rest. After a brief pause, his frustration became evident. Pathetic, he muttered while pacing thoughtfully. Now we will continue with the third lesson. This exercise deals with the correct execution of the position of the front leaning rest, commonly referred to as the push-up. From the position of attention, resolutely bring one's body to the earth, supporting it solely on the base of both palms and the balls of the feet. The arms shall remain shoulder-width apart. Carry the body in a straight line from the head, across the back and down the line of the legs. Upon the command of the count of one, cadets will lower their bodies by bending in the arms at the elbow, so as to bring the chest into contact with the earth below it, and then rise back up to the original starting position. Are we clear? Yes, they shouted. Master Drill. Master Lee then launched himself boldly onto the ground, into the push-up position, and continued with his lesson. From the position of front-leaning rest, the command of four-count push-up may commence. From the front-leaning rest, the cadet will first draw the feet up under the body and the hands, then rise up to the standing position, and then lower the body back down by bending in the knees, return the hands to the earth, and resume the position of front-leaning rest. The complete combination of the four moves shall be considered a count of one. Now did I make myself perfectly clear? Yes, Master Drill, they responded. Very well, cadets. Let us begin again. Company, he commanded. Attention! Master Drill just shook his head and then proceeded with the lesson. Company, he urged. Front-leaning rest position. Move! Upon my count, the company will echo the said numbered push-up during the upward execution of the movement, until such a time as a counter-command is issued. Is that clear? Yes, they replied. Master Drill. One, he commanded. One, they replied. Two, he continued. Two, they echoed after each repetition. Master Drill carried on with his lessons throughout the afternoon, until he felt that he and they had learned something. Itzel. The Silver Go sailed north with all the speed that she was able. Favorable winds and currents were with them as they fled northward. The enemy fleet, failing to give chase to them, was a cause for concern, and Captain O'Brien ordered a continuous watch toward all horizons in case the enemy had formed some sort of a blockade ahead of them. Why Jin Jang Lo had not pursued them was a mystery. But perhaps one small ship and its contents were not grand enough to risk sailing into enemy waters. They sighted few ships during their voyage, except on one brief occasion, when the strange, brilliantly painted junks of the newly discovered and mysterious lands of Shamroon to the far east appeared upon the horizon. Flanking the silver gull for a time, the foreign vessels sailed a similar course, as the current pushed them all northward toward Gaul, or further destinations. The mysterious culture of the recently discovered Easterners made, dis made, made diplomacy uncertain. But despite the conditions, emissaries were crossing the endless sea in efforts to forge valuable alliances against the Dragonian advances. O'Brien was relieved when the foreigners plotted a new course and sailed east beyond the horizon, for whether they were friends or foes was unknown. Many small villages dotted the eastern coast of Firminor. Anglers and whalers loyal to Drachmar in the south or Etzel to the north occupied most of them. Much of the coastline was rugged, heavily forested and scarcely populated, with many hidden bays and inlets providing a refuge for py pirates and covert landings by Dragonia. Because of this, O'Brien sailed far from the sight of land in order pre to prevent their discovery. Plotting their course adeptly, his charts of this part of the ocean were excellent. Heavily laden with personnel and their goods, 
he estimated their speed at about seven knots, although the silver gull could travel much faster with a lighter load and filled sails. In three days they would cover over five hundred nautical miles from Port Sina. He did not realize the tension in his body or the worry in his mind until he heard the words, Eat so, sir, reported by the ensign on duty atop of the masthead. On the port bow. Adjust your course, Mr. Wells, O'Brien directed, and guide us in. Aye, Captain, he replied. Handling the wheel with ease, Mr. Wells stood well over six feet, dark-haired and brown-eyed. His gaze was piercing, piercingly intellectual, despite a certain youthful softness to his features. Black pants and boots and an off-white sailor's shirt protected him from the occasional salty spraying of the ocean. The winds, which had blown them so steadily along, started to quiet somewhat, becoming puffy and occasionally stiff. It was a dangerous condition for sailing. Mind the sails, O'Brien commanded, as a powerful gust of wind burdened the ship. Run out the main sheet and spill some of this wind. Mr. Wells, adjust your course to match the wind. I, Captain, he affirmed, matching the wind. That's it. Trim the sheets. Trim the sheets, Lieutenant Stephen Jackman, the first mate commanded. Mr. Jackman was a strong man with a firm disposition. Laugh lines caused by the worries of his station flanked his well-formed face. Balanced cheekbones, a straight nose, and honest blue eyes that mirrored the trustworthiness of the man echoed the respect that he received. Balding on top, his salt and pepper hair, and the footnotes are about nautical terminology, his salt and pepper hair was well trimmed and professional beneath his black watch cap. His blue sailor's coat and standard uniform were impeccable. Prepare to, prepare to sail by the luff, O'Brien ordered. Bring the jib amidships and luff the mainsail. Slack the mainsail, Mr. Jackman echoed. Take us closer to the wind, Mr. Wells. Aye, Captain, he replied. Mr. Wells steered them well and adjusted their course to match the varying breezes. Beneath his guiding hands, they slowly approached the steep towering cliffs flanking Eatsel's harbor. Rising from steep rocky beaches, with the harbor mouth between them, were two rocky cliffs rising some two hundred feet above the ocean's surface. Twin watchtower fortifications occupied each hilltop. Overlooking the outer sea, the harbor mouth, and the inner harbor, each fort was a sizable castle in and of itself, built in three joined sections of varying heights on the south side, and four similarly joined towers on the north crest, their grey granite walls rose to sixty or seventy feet in some places, and were equipped with crenellated parapets, gatehouses, and formidable defensive outworks. Any enemy ships sailing at Eitzel would quickly fall victim to massive stone bombardments from the castle's trebuchets, devastating ballista projectiles, and a rain of arrows. Historically, the harbor's defenses were such that no invading force had ever attempted an attack from the sea. Furl the aft sails, O'Brien directed. Lower the mainsails and wing out the jib. We'll ride the breeze in nice and easy. Aye, sir, Mr. Jackman replied. Great chiming bells then began to ring out from the north tower, filling the air with their strong with their song and warning Eitzel of their approach. Hundreds of seagulls and other birds glided near the ship, hoping for discarded scraps of fish or other garbage. Their exciting cries filled the air in a chaotic symphony, mingling with the crashing surf and the passing winds. <clears throat> and the footnotes include luff to bring the ship closer to the wind. Defensive outworks include things such as stone walls, earth embankments, stockade fences, and so on. And the jib is a triangular sail extending from the foremast of a ship. Okay, a few more seconds. Smells of civilization wafted past them, tantalizing them with the odors of grilled meats, the bakery, and rotting fish. The harbor and its surrounding hills resulted from a massive retreating ice-aged flow and a gargantuan block of separated ice coming to its final rest and melting there, thus forming the four by five miles wide body that was Eitzel Harbor. Beyond the cliffs was a bustling port dotted with hundreds of seafaring vessels of all kinds and supported by a vast city of Furman. 
The city of Etzel was the gateway into the kingdom of Highwall, and ruled by its great King James Adrian Redpool. The royal Redpool line was ancient and fertile, and King James was no exception. Middle-aged and virile, his wife had borne him five sons, the eldest of which was now twenty years of age and already a capable military captain. The harbour coastline was an intricate mass of wharves, jutting docks, and floating moorings capable of serving over one hundred ships at a time. Dedicated to shipbuilding, Eatsell's North Quarter was home to the influential Shipwrights Guild. The rest of the harbour was sprawling with life and sea craft, and home to the largest whaling industry on the continent. Land-based tradesmen of all kinds supported them, and the surrounding lands were rich in both farming and mineral wealth as well. West of Eatsell, the terrain slowly rises, hilly at first, and then more mountainous beyond the walls of Castle Redpool. Further west, the forest thickens, growing ever deeper and greater toward the heart of the dark wood. There, among the hills of the untamed forest, were rich sources of iron and copper, and their extraction had made the Redpool monarchy rich. High walls deeded lands spread for fifty miles in every direction, and its influence reached even further. The kingdom and its vast fleet was likely the most powerful one in all of Fermanagh, and the monarchy's rule had gone uncontested for centuries. Ranger Sibylline, O'Brien said, between the cheerful cries of a thousand seagulls, have you spotted our ships yet? I see them, sir, she reported, anchored near the long wharf, off the port bow. And that's where we'll leave off, and we'll start up again on the top of page 254. Thank you, I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great night.